dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe, welcome back to Kryptonites, the no BS blockchain channel built with the community for the community. And tonight we have another really exciting guest, Nicholas Gregory from Commerce Block. Pleasure to have you, Nick. All right, so we were talking about some really interesting story about your father, is that correct? Yes, so um, didn't have the most normal upbringing. My father's a musician. I guess he was famous for playing the, the saxophone solo for, for George Michael's Careless Whisper. He also did Honky Tonk Woman as well for the Rolling Stones. But I guess if I uh, want to do an icebreak, I can always say my dad played sax on Careless, Careless Whisper by George Michael. But That is so cool. So did you hear like, so I'm never going to dance again? <laughs> I remember being in the 90s in L.A. and it was being played all the time. And it was a very good opener, especially with the English accent. It helped open a lot of doors and many nightclubs, etc. That song was just <laughs> absolutely legendary, wasn't it? To dance yeah. slow jams, you know, back in the day at the balls and everything. Have you ever had a chance to dance on Careless Whisper? No, but you know, if you invite, if you're in college and you invite people back to your room and it was very useful. <laughs> That's a good tip right there. <laughs> awesome. So obviously, Nick, you have been involved in Bitcoin for a long time now. You were in New York at one point, yes. then you moved back to London. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? Obviously in the UK, I think most people know you and most of the, the core devs at Bitcoin know you, mm -hmm. uh, but a little bit about yourself would be amazing. Yes, I'm a technologist, so I graduated, uh, did software engineering, and then I, I worked in the financial system. So I worked for various banks, uh, Merrill Lynch and then JP Morgan. Then in 2010, I found myself in New York through work. And around 2012, um, I just got into Bitcoin. I knew about it maybe a year before, and then in a the place I was working out, a guy said, talk to me about mining. And I thought, isn't that cool? I can just sit at home and make money. Now, unfortunately, 2012, those days were kind of gone. But, you know, I did discover Bitcoin and it just quickly became a hobby. And I was fortunate to be living in New York where there was quite a good Bitcoin community and some of the core devs were there. So that it was able, I was able to learn quite a lot at a, at a slow pace, uh, kind of like a fast pace. So, and there were some interesting people there. You have Chain Code Labs in New York. You have some of the core devs in New York. So I was able to kind of like learn stuff and ended up you know, kind of working on, on Bitcoin, like building layers on top of it, which has kind of always been my speciality. That is very, very cool. And as you probably experienced, so Bitcoin has lost 70% four times in the past 10 years, but has ended up recovering. What does that metric tell you if Bitcoin has been surviving 10 years? Is that a significant milestone or is it not really something special to you? Yeah, I mean, a lot of people think that Bitcoin's 10 years old. I think it's got 10 years of engineering. Oh. And, you know, it's been battle tested for 10 years. And every year it's in... It's, it's around, it's kind of more in people's minds. New, newer generations of people, you know, kind of know about it. And it, it's a test of time. And I think to, to be where it is now, it's quite impressive. If you'd have told me in 2012 where it would have been in 2016, I would, I would have taken that. To think that we hit, you know, even though we're only $4,000, I would have taken that, you know, in 2012. I would have, I would have taken $500 back then. So I think it's done pretty well. It's quite amazing because people used to compare Bitcoin with the tulip bubble or the dot-com bubble, but a decade of survival, like you said, uh, and building yeah. up is, is quite an achievement, isn't it? Yeah, and people don't realize how complex of a network it is. You know, I worked in banks. We would have loved to have had a system with 10 years with no, essentially no downtime. That's phenomenal. Yeah. There's no such thing. And to have such, you know, such high amounts of transactions going through Bitcoin every, you know, every 10 minutes and to have never really gone down in 10 years is, is unheard of. And it, yeah, I think it's a real, you know, a sign of the hard work that many people have put through, whether that's the miners, the core devs, the people running nodes, the people running exchanges. It's, it's quite you know, com a compliment to achieve that. It's amazing, right? And I think recently Tom Lee likes to talk about how Bitcoin has surpassed PayPal in terms of annual transactions. It's 1.3 trillion USD uh, last year alone uh, beating PayPal. Is, is that, a, once again, another significant milestone for you? Or? Yeah, I mean, transactions are kind of strange because we don't really know how many transactions. We know that Bitcoin kind of maxes out at about seven per second. Or, but I think the fact that it's used, that, yeah, and it's used quite a lot for remittance, there's, you know, there's an active market for it, it's phenomenal. I mean, who would have taken that? And there's been so many attempts to do kind of like e-money before. And, you know, Bitcoin, for whatever reason, I think a lot of the cards fell in the right places, has been a success and is a success. And 
it's, you know, it's kind of like a mainstay in people's mindsets. I think there's not many people who don't know about Bitcoin in the Western world or maybe in third world as well. And, you know, it's, it's obviously not going to go away anytime soon. So. But definitely, it's been a huge success story so far. I really want to ask you a question since you've been in this space for so long and you were in New York where it kind of all happened. Mm -hmm. In terms of the whole Satoshi Nakamoto thing, this is a huge topic these days. We hear the term fake Toshi, whether it's a guy or a girl, Satoshi is female. It's a group of people. Uh, obviously, we don't know for sure, but do you feel like that person, it's one person, several people? Do you have a few names that could be a part of it? What is your overall take on this crazy phenomenon that's going on? I mean, I think it was a group of people. I don't think it's such a big deal who it was, though. I mean, you know, and also we, what Bitcoin was 10 years ago isn't what it is now. Mm. It's evolved. There's some, you know, there's some very bright people working on it today. And, you know, it's, it's over 10 years. It's had multiple iterations. So, you know, whoever wrote the white paper, whoever wrote the original code, it, it's, it's not that important. I mean, I know there's a fascination about it, but whoever those people are, they're human. They have faults. And I think it's best not to eulogize them. I mean, obviously, there's the famous names people associate. There's the fake Toshis. I mean, but it's, it's kind of really irrelevant now. And I think focusing on that, you know, there, it, there's no point to it. You know, the, the, the people working on it now that are, the, you know, that are the rock stars, the superstars, and they're, you know, it's a, it's a far bigger system. I mean, you know, I, I think I heard about Bitcoin in 2010, but the people I know that were actually involved in it said there was hardly any transactions. So the system is much more complex now and has much, you know, essentially much brighter people working on it. That's a really good point. So looking at it, not as who is the inventor, but the yeah. people who keep on working on the system yeah. is more important for you, at least. Right yeah, because I think it's much more complex. I mean, when Bitcoin came out, there was, only, there was no concept of a miner. There was, it, you basically had a node. Anyone that ran a, a node, or was it a node, ran the client, was mining, was a node. There was no mining pools. If you see the complexity it has now with mining pools, dedicated miners, separate nodes, it's, it's, it's a totally different beast, a much more complicated beast. That's a really interesting angle. And I would love to ask you because it seems like this whole Bitcoin maximalist term, and maybe some people portray you as a Bitcoin maximalist, and it really feels like almost like a religion sometimes, like a cult. As in, you know, if you go through religion, you have that story, that person that has created people who want to follow because their values and principles are connected to that specific mm -hmm. symbol. Do you feel, why is it that Bitcoin tends to have more of a cult than other? Is it the history? Is it the financial crisis? What, what is the triggering the people that are so into it? I mean, yeah, I've been called a maxillist. I don't think I am one, but, um, you know, in any open source software, you know, think of open source software that's got nothing to do with money. It, it does become quite territorial and people always feel they have a right to have a say in the way it's being built, even though they're not building it. When you throw in money, it becomes 10 times worse. It's people's livelihoods. But I don't think Bitcoin maximum is necessarily healthy. I mean, you know, obviously we had 2017 where a lot of the ICOs were questionable, but there are some projects out there that are interesting. No one can tell me that Monero is not interesting. I mean. I personally am quite involved and, and, and a big fan of Decred. Now, do I think it's going to overtake Bitcoin? Absolutely not. But uh, there's definitely some innovation there that's superior to Bitcoin. I think what they're doing around governance is pretty unique. Anyone who downloads Decred and uses their client, uses their application, it's got some special stuff around it. The way they've done kind of like hybrid uh, proof of stake, proof of mining pro, uh, you know, consensus is pretty unique. And I think Bitcoin needs a few alts to keep it honest. I mean, uh, there's, there's a lot of innovation that's going to happen in the next few years that can't be done in Bitcoin because Bitcoin is a, you know, is a, a living, very important piece of infrastructure. And that innovation will probably happen elsewhere. Now, yes, if that innovation is successful, it probably will find its way back onto Bitcoin. But we do need alts. We can't, you know, we can't have this Bitcoin religion. It's not healthy. And I, for one, am not appreciative of the people who, who, who you know, do clickbaits to kind of insult other projects because... There's a lot of people in this industry that talk, but getting something working, getting something live is, an, is successful. I mean, it is, is, a, is a huge undertaking. I mean, I'm not the biggest fan of Ethereum, but I respect the fact that they built something that works. And it has a, you know, a collection of people that have made relative success out of it. I think that's I, healthy. I really like that statement, especially knowing that if the crypto assets market is between 100 and 200 billion mm -hmm. US dollars, 
that's a drop in the ocean compared to a single company like mm -hmm. Amazon or Facebook. So why compete and why not just stay together or stronger? Yeah. Well, and competition's healthy. Yeah. But yeah, some, I think some of the maximum gets a bit ugly and gets... And, it, and, and interestingly enough, I think a lot of it is clickbait. The people I know, and I'm not going to mention names, in, in, but the Bitcoin core developers I know, they re I've never heard them badmouth other projects. They just get on with their own stuff. And I think, you know, tend to your own garden. I think that's the way it should be, yeah? Let the markets to decide, yeah? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Some people like to shop at one place. Some people like to shop at the other. They can still survive, yeah. right? They don't necessarily... And, you know, and I think money is very tribal anyway. And any tribe has got, a, has got the freedom to choose its medium of exchange. Yeah. Beautifully put. Sorry. Beautifully put. I, I love that statement. Uh, in terms of innovation, you're just talking about innovative solutions. Mm -hmm. uh, you're working on side chains, yes. as far as I understand. Could you please imagine my grandma Susie? By the way, I don't have a grandma called Susie. <laughs> but imagine my grandma Susie walked into this room. How would you explain a side chain really in layman terms so that everyone out there can understand what it is and why we need it? Yes, yeah, so, I mean, Again, a side chain is a, I wouldn't say a controversial word, but different people use it differently. So you have people like um, Blockstream, they built this liquid side chain, which is kind of like a collection of nodes that are running via multi-sig their own network, but it's pegged to Bitcoin. So Bitcoin can peg, you, you peg out of Bitcoin into the liquid network and peg out. We don't do that. We have our own version of a side chain, which is you know, similar, but whereas we're not really doing the pegging, we kind of attest to Bitcoin. So we run our own side chain, we use Bitcoin's proof of work as a form of kind of security, you know, censorship resistance as well. But, you know, it's, it's a, essentially a, a chain layered on top of Bitcoin or any other proof of work coin or potentially any proof of stake coin. And it you know, shares a lot of the semantics, but it's, it's layered either on the top or on the side, depending on the way you want it implemented. And there's different use cases. So some people have built side chains as a layer on top of Bitcoin so that, you know, you don't have to worry about Bitcoin transaction fees or block times. And it's a, a faster transfer mechanism of Bitcoin. You have people like what we've done. We do at Commerce Block is where we build kind of like asset backed side chains to represent like, uh, you know, potentially an equity or a precious metal. And we use Bitcoin's proof of work to secure it. But it's it would be essentially a precious metal side chain. If that makes sense. That's a really yeah, that's very, very interesting. So. Would this analogy work? Like imagine blockchain was this avenue mm -hmm. or this, this road and side chains are like extra lanes yeah. to help traffic? Yeah, the way you could think of it, I mean, you, you mentioned, you know, where are we on Bitcoin transactions? Well, we, we all know that the blocks are kind of full. So the way I like to say is the highway is being built. Now we're gonna obviously, I don't think there'll be major changes of Bitcoin in the next few years, but there'll be little tweaks to make the highway more optimal. But side chains, things like Lightning, that's like building the buses, the public transport, because we, we need to fit more on there. And you know, side chains is one of the approaches. Lightning, which is making a lot of noise at the moment, is another approach. And, and there'll be other approaches that you know, I, I haven't heard of or hasn't, that have, hasn't even been thought about yet. That's the way to think of it. That's a great analogy. So the buses, so blockchain would be some yeah. sort of highway and yeah. side chains will be the buses. Yeah. I guess island. lightning's probably like, you know, zapping people around like it's in Star Trek style. But yeah, <laughs> but, yeah, we're def I'd say, yeah, we're like a bus. We're, we're a bus for other assets to sit on this Bitcoin blockchain. Very interesting. Fascinating. So in terms of the lightning network, I know just a few minutes ago we were talking about it together and you seem quite optimistic on the progress that has been made. Could you tell us a little more about the lightning network and, and how you see Bitcoin? Yeah, I mean, I'm not. An expert on the Lightning. I mean, I guess when SegWit happened last year, it was always thought that you know Lightning would come soon. I'm quite surprised at how quickly the network grew, uh, and it sh and I think a lot to do with that is there's a lot of excitement and a, a lot of maybe developers that probably didn't want to do Bitcoin Core development because you know Bitcoin Core is old C++. It's it's kind of hard to do anything right now. It's there's not much that you know that's going to be changed or it's slow. And I think Bit Lightning has kind of put another layer on top of Bitcoin where developers can come in and, and do some, be creative. And that's why you've seen quite a lot of, of interest and in apps that have been built. But essentially Lightning, it's a way of caching transactions. I mean, I'm trying to talk about it at the highest level, but the way I see it is it's a cache on top of Bitcoin. Now you have payment channels which allow people to route messages across each other, but I've, I view them as all kind of caches. That makes sense? That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. As of today, Bitcoin has about seven transactions per second, yeah. is it? Yeah, I think that's the official amount. How, 
how far can we scale, do you see, in, in maybe the next year or in two years from now? Well, I, I think, I, I mean, Bitcoin, you are going to see, I don't think the, the block size will change. I think that's because of political reasons. But you will see more transactions in the blocks. I think you'll, I think there's Schnorr signatures that are going to come, which will allow kind of signature aggregation. And I think that's where Bitcoin will do. There'll be lots of probably unexciting changes to the rest of the world, but they'll gradually pack more in. And I think it'll be up to the second layers to get Bitcoin to scale to the levels that we want to see with things like, you know, when people compare it to Visa. And I think things like Lightning, potentially sidechains. And again, there's probably things that haven't even been thought of that are going to be needed to get to that level. But you know, it's, so Lightning's still very much an experimental project. And it's still got a long way to go. And I think the UI experience is, is, is going to be tricky with Lightning. I mean, anyone that's used Bitcoin for, for online payment realize it's not optimal. If you get the fee wrong, it's potentially, you know, you potentially miss a payment. So then there still needs to be a lot of work on wallet design. I think Lightning is actually potentially more complex because you have to route payments and what happens if payments don't get routed. And I think where I'd like to see a lot of work is actually just making simple, simple, uh, better UI so, you know, your granny Susie can use and stuff. And that's where it <laughs> needs to just kind of probably work to be done. But I would love my granny Susie to be able to, yeah. <laughs> to use this. Definitely there's, there's work in terms of UX as well. Yeah. Uh, the, the user experience is very complicated still mm -hmm. as of today. Charles Hoskinson talked about how there is the era of the protocols, the blockchain protocols, and now is the era of side chains, mm -hmm. like we're talking about in terms of scalability. From an investment angle, do you think that people out there should be interested in investing in projects that are building side chain solutions? Well, I think if we've learned anything in the last 10 years is blockchains have shown to be very resilient, which is a good thing. Uh, mutability is essentially what you're paying for with Bitcoin. I mean, I think um, Benjamin Franklin said money is time. Mm -hmm. I think nothing shows that better than Bitcoin. Bitcoin may be money, but it's also the best time machine we've ever seen. You know, something that's written in, in the blockchain in 2014 is there for life. To attack Bitcoin and reverse that information is going to cost billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, we've seen that uh, blockchains are very resilient. Well, specifically the Bitcoin blockchain, but we've also seen they're hard to scale. There's been a lot of scaling debates, scaling wars, and it's been questionable if they can ever scale. So we need layer two, you know, we need layers on top. And to wait to, to look at a blockchain, it's like a database. I mean, databases are good for, you know, for, for, for the semantics of constraining data. But if you want a database to work for, say, an e-commerce site, you have to essentially build a cache on top. Mm -hmm. So now we need to build these layers to get it to... to to scale to the levels we need to support e-commerce, to support day-to-day -day finance. And I think that's where, now the companies to invest in, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's a crapshoot, you know, you have to, I tell you always Lots invest. Lots of speculation. Yeah, yeah, and you have to invest in teams. I mean, you know, I'm obviously, I'm not gonna pitch my company, but I can tell you the challenges are finding people, you know, who can do this work. It's not easy. It's not easy, yeah. No, it's not, and it's, it, it takes a long time. Absolutely, so the other day I remember we had an event in Tokyo and uh, we had Da Hong Fei from NIO. Mm -hmm. And he kind of talked about like, right now it's all about building the infrastructure. And he, he had a really cool analogy saying like, the deeper the hole, the wider the hole, the higher the sky rise. Mm -hmm. and, and right now everyone's building the infrastructure. So do you feel sometimes like, due to the lack of news, it's become a bit more boring recently or maybe not for you as someone in, in that space, but. Well, it's interesting because like, I mean, 2018 will be remembered for probably as a bad year for crypto. Absolutely, yeah. But that is only talking about the price. Um, yeah, I made a few mistakes in crypto. I never saw the ICO market coming. I thought Ethereum was dead with the Dow, but ICOs came back. And I didn't see Lightning moving the speed it would in 2018. And I think from a technology point of view, 2018 was pretty good. I mean, we saw Lightning grew. We saw side chains appear, you know, Liquid came out with Blockstream. I mean, we did our own side chain, but we haven't, you know, kind of gone live yet. But there's been a lot of innovation and technology that we hadn't seen before. And I think sometimes the markets, there's two things they seem to focus on, price, which we know, and something that's probably even more boring, ETFs. And uh, I can't deal with another ETF Bitcoin not happening. So <laughs> I think there's nothing more boring than talking about Bitcoin ETFs. But yeah, I think 2018 from a technology point of view was pretty, pretty, pretty good. It's been going well, right? Hash yeah. rates as well. There are a lot yeah. of metrics showing that despite the drop in price, yeah. technologically we're... And there's some interesting things that were designed. I mean, you know, 
mining is very centralized in Bitcoin. There were some like interesting ideas to decentralize mining. Uh, Matt Carello wrote the Better Hash Protocol, which I know a few people are looking at. I think, this, as I said, sidechains and lightning change, open things up. We also saw the demise of Bitmain, which was kind of yeah. seen as one of the companies that's centralizing mining. So I think, and even though the price went down, there was a lot of institutions that started to move into crypto. I mean, Fidelity made some big moves. You saw things like ICE and the backed you know, exchanges. And Absolutely. Yeah. They, they weren't around in 2016. So. And that's a really good point because Fidelity are actually the group that created the fixed protocol back in 92, if you remember well, and a company that created a protocol that standardized the way banks would exchange or, or, or have liquidity pools. It's pretty cool that such a traditional company would get into this. Yeah, space, and they, have a, they have a very mature approach. Like I do know people at Fidelity. We have spoken to them. They, they started mining a few years back, not to make money, but just to understand it. Oh, interesting. And that's, you know, that's quite you know, enlightening to see a company, you know, because we always, we knock the existing financial system, which we have every right to do. But there are some people there that are trying to learn this and do it proper and get their, you know, their feet wet. And That's really cool, that growth mindset, yeah. despite, you know, being there and creating the great technology for traditional markets, still open to yeah, no, emerging yeah. technology. A lot of banks, you know, they, they have big budgets. They do have a lot of good technologists. A, a lot of the issues are because of human issues. They're not necessarily because of the technology they employ. So there are good guys there trying to do something useful and stuff. That's a really interesting point. So there's one question I wanted to ask you based on something you said earlier, mm -hmm. and you were talking about databases. Mm -hmm. And obviously we have the centralized, distributed, decentralized mm -hmm. databases. And I believe we had this conversation just an hour ago where we're wondering how many of the cryptocurrency projects truly need blockchain. And I would love to get your view on this project. Well, for me, it's very simple. If you read the, um, the, the first paragraph of the Satoshi's white paper it says peer-to-peer -peer cash system and I always say if you want to use a blockchain are you doing something peer-to-peer -peer? Peer -peer. otherwise I mean blockchain is a bad database there's no querying facilities it's not really designed for large data sets it's really about how you produce the box in a trustless way so if I want to send you Bitcoin blockchain's great because it'll you know it's trustless we don't have to trust each other if, we wanna, if I wanted to send you a, 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 an asset-backed token, peer-to-peer, -peer, blockchain's great because we would, hopefully, in, in our world, we would char trust that blockchain because it's backed by the company that owns the asset and the blockchain would provide transparency. It would allow me to download my own node, make sure that I'm sending my transactions, make sure there's no funky business going on. It, it provides that transparency. But when people start talking about you know, supply chain, which I love in blockchains, I don't get that. Or when people are building essentially closed systems of a blockchain, there is no reason to use it. You should be using a database. You're, I, mean, I sometimes see these you know, securities platforms building blockchain securities. Uh, how's that better that, or different or makes any sense compared to a database security? I don't get that. And I think sometimes they're just using the blockchain word to maybe boost sales or get VC money coming in but it doesn't make sense to me. Because of that buzz, right? Yeah. So if a company is using a private blockchain, a permission blockchain, to you at this point, because of the lack of scalability, it doesn't really make sense? Well, I mean, uh, in a way, the way we implement sidechains, they're permission blockchains, but they're public. So you know who's basically is creating the blocks and you know under what circumstance. And anyone can download a node and basically see what's going on. And, you know, because we, use Bitcoin to kind of preserve history, we can make sure that blocks can't be reordered, etc. Mm -hmm. But if you're just an internal system using blockchain for your, your app, it makes absolutely no sense. Mm. What about blockchains who don't want to use open source? Do you, do you believe like every blockchain should be somehow connected to open source because of this transparency kind of fundamental? Well, again, if we, if we think of a blockchain as a peer-to-peer -peer system, if if me and you are going to trade whether Bitcoin or some precious metal over, we need to trust the software that's running. If it's not open source, then God knows what I've put in there. <laughs> absolutely, <laughs> yeah. absolutely. Because there are many companies who yeah. actually do that, right? So it's kind of surprising. Yeah, I think R3 see. is not open source or something, or I heard something. Or I, we always look at R3 and Hyperledger and try and understand why they're not using databases. But Awesome. So there is one more topic that I'd love to cover sure. with you. Uh, and. To be honest, I would love to go on for hours and hours if we had more time. Yeah. Definitely please come back in the future. But 
we were, we were talking about STOs and mm -hmm. security tokens, and I and the reason why I'm mentioning this is because I know you've written, you've actually produced some content yeah. on this particular topic, and um, I would love to, especially with your background in traditional finance, I'd love to hear your take on security tokens, mm -hmm. STOs, as it's kind of the hyped term these days, if you don't mind sharing a little bit of what you've wrote about. Yeah, I mean, obviously there's a liquidity issue in STOs and they're not raising the money people had hoped because there's no liquidity. But also for me, I mean, at the moment they're very much handicapped by existing regulation. And if you look at a lot of these STO platforms, they're a collection of databases that are using the word blockchain. And once they create these tokens, which are, you know they need to have like a, an STO database, a share registry database, a KYC database, they then can only be traded on a, a regulated exchange, which has a database. I don't know how that's anything better than the existing financial system. I don't know why that's an improvement over me not using E-Trade to buy a share. Now, do I think STOs could be useful in the future? Yes. But we need to, if we're going to use blockchains, we have to use them for what they're designed for. Like, I, I struggle to see a shared blockchain for all securities. I don't think a blockchain could ever scale. I believe if, if you're a company, you know, whatever your company's called, let's call it T.com, perhaps they should have a blockchain called T.com and they would be in charge of basically making sure all transactions are KYC'd, appropriate AML. If they want to basically, you know, preserve state, they could put that against their favorite blockchain. But essentially it would be to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer trades. And, you know, can that happen in existing regulation? Perhaps. There's nothing stopping me going to the local pub and shelling shares in my company and I think that same attitude should be looked at you know at building STOs I think if if you look at the early days of the internet um, there was the B2B um, wars where many big companies came up with these very complex B2B protocols none of them really ever scaled or worked and were probably worse than the existing B2B protocols out there you know some people like at Google Yahoo came up with very simple protocols basically called REST where if I wanted to get a stock price I would just put URL question mark stock equals blah and I'd get a stock price and that threw out all these complicated B2B protocols and I think as I don't think the regulation necessarily has to change but as people realize what a blockchain is and how to make it more peer-to-peer -peer and how you can fit into the existing regulations I think common sense may prevail but at the moment, I don't think any of them are an improvement of the existing financial system. These regulation systems, especially on a global scale, are yeah. extremely complex, right? In order yeah. to get lawyers to work on smart contracts and everyone agree on a global sandbox, it, it's quite a, a lot of work, yeah, right? Yeah, I think there's a, there's a knowledge gap. I think there's very few people who understand what a blockchain is. And, you know, if you look at a lot of these um, regulations, they're bit by lawyers and you have, you know, your, your, your blockchain consultants are kind of colluding with them. And it's, it's not a blockchain for me. It's, it's basically, if you were to take the existing financial system, payment system, and replace databases with blockchains, you would not have Bitcoin. Bitcoin worked because it was peer-to-peer -peer and trustless. I think STOs need to look more like that for them to work. And uh, I could go on about it for a while, but I mean, it's... Um, at the moment, they don't really make sense. Doesn't really make sense. And those are some really good points. It, do you believe someday we will have, for example, the equities market on the blockchain or commodities market on the blockchain? I mean, the way to look at it, if you look at IBM.com, what did IBM.com mean to you in the 90s? It meant you go into the yellow pages, finding an address, and it was a big building somewhere. Now, what does IBM mean to you now? You go on a website, you trust IBM.com, why? Because as an SSL certificate, that you know, says that IBM.com is IBM.com and anything written on that page is, is, is trusted in law. I think once we get to that level with potentially assets, whether they're securities or precious, you know, commodities, where I can find a blockchain, I trust it, whether using SSL, I mean, I'm, we've built some protocols around that, that you know, maybe another day we'll explain to you, but we can trust that that asset points to the underlying asset, whether that's the security or the, or the commodity, then yeah, I think we could get there. But we have to have that mindset, that shift from what IBM means to what it means on the internet. And I think once we get that, we could potentially get there. And that's gonna take time, I and mean, it's not, it, Bitcoin took time. I mean, I mean, I'm a technologist, I didn't get my head around Bitcoin straight away. I, when I first read the white paper, it was double Dutch. 
and you know when I first looked at it I thought 10 minute block times who's going to wait at a coffee shop for 10 minutes it's a joke <laughs> yeah. and you know I, I, I thought it was a lump of you know I thought it was very I thought it was just a pet project for a bit of fun but it took me a while to get my head around it it was more about sound money and I think STOs need that kind of you know they need to get around what, what would be a peer-to-peer -peer security what would be a peer-to-peer -to -peer token that represents a real world asset so the secondary market, that peer-to-peer -peer secondary market for you is what matters the most yes. in terms of bringing this Well, if you look at Bitcoin, there was, no one built Bitcoin exchanges. You had a peer-to-peer -peer market and then exchanges got built on top. I think that what's happening with STOs is people are building these regulated exchanges before the STOs are even there. And I think market, technology doesn't work that way. You know, technology evolves. You, you can't, you know, you, what's it, the... The cathedral approach you can't design something in a cathedral or, or the general approach of designing it and then hoping that, that the market will take off you Absolutely. you build the layers and it grows over time and that's how the internet grew a lot of the, the protocols of the internet were never designed they evolved and i think we need to see that with tokens in talking about evolution so actually that's a, leads to my final question for you obviously um you love bitcoin well maybe not a maximalist but you you, you do appreciate the work and you've been involved for a very long time in terms of reaching mass adoption, uh, for someone to use Bitcoin or blockchain without really re realizing that they're using the blockchain, just they understand Bitcoin only, what would we need to really go over that gap? You know that. I, I think we just need better consumer apps. It's consumer very, it's apps. It's very hard. I mean, yeah, I don't want my mother using Bitcoin because she's only going to phone me up and drive me nuts about <laughs> the, the, the wallets and getting the fee right. And, you know, I, it's not worth the hassle for me. So my grandma Susie yeah, as well? No. no. You don't want her to call you? No, no. I don't. Okay. And, you know, that, that needs to prove it. And, and I accept that Bitcoin is very hard to use for payment. Now, as a store of value, it's fine. We have good, cust you know, if you want to use a hardware wallet, if you want to keep it in Zappo, that works. But for using it for day-to-day -day, you know, purchases on Amazon, it, it's, a, it's, it's tricky. Um, you know, I have friends that have, I think I mentioned to you, I've got friends involved with Tripkey. Yeah. They're going through some of the testing. Yeah, you know, th th there's challenges. And, I, you know, and they, they've got a good team. They'll fix them. But, yeah, you know, we need more people like that getting. Now, they're going about, you know, getting crypto to be used in, in kind of e-commerce. And we, they're, 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 they're fixing a lot of the challenges. And I think more people need to do that, fix those challenges for, to be used in e-commerce and day-to-day -day payments. I think, I think Bitcoin wallets probably won't move that much. But things like Lightning where you can do micro payments. I think the wallets, if you're seeing some of the wallets coming out of Lightning, I think they'll fix it. That's where you would be able to buy your coffee or yes. the, the dream that we all have yeah. of going to. And I think they'll fix it because a lot of things are driven by demand. Like I heard the other day, um, you know, decentralized exchanges are a joke. And I go, well, there was no need. Centralized exchanges were providing everything we needed. But now centra all centralized exchanges essentially want you to upload your passport, give you your date of birth, tell you where your grandmother Susie was born. I mean, it's the surveillance state. I'm pretty sure decentralized exchanges are going to get a lot better because people are not going to want to put so much information into them. So That is a really interesting part. But yeah, I, and, I, and I'm seeing decentralized exchanges pop up, which are pretty impressive. Um, yeah, atomic swaps and a lot yeah. of the technology is allowing to cross-train If you look at the Decred team, they're coming up with an interesting decentralized exchange because now there's a demand. People do not want to put in their whole life story into an exchange just to buy and sell Bitcoin. So. Absolutely, and control their, yeah. their wealth or their assets, right? It's an yeah. important part it's of it. It's a security risk. Every once in a while you hear about a data breach, you know, personal details are stolen. People don't want that. I don't. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. So it's kind of like as the next step for really mass adoption to join this community and this new asset class, it would be for to have some sort of payment solution yeah. where people could spend it on a day-to-day -day basis. And that for you would be the check mark. Just, yeah, we need more consumer apps. I mean, I think... Bitcoin has worked well as sound money. I think there's no denying that, but we need, you know, we need more usage. And I think it's going to happen. It just takes a while. I don't remember when the Bitcoin, when, when, the, inter, when the internet became used. I remember in 2002, people telling me no one's going to buy anything off Amazon.com. And I remember now, at some point, no one ever buys anything not on Amazon.com. And, you know, I don't think there's not going to be an announcement. It's just at some point you're going to look weird for not using crypto. Yeah. Without a doubt. Wow. This has been a fascinating talk, Nicholas. I really, really loved it. I would love you to actually tell us a little more about Commerce Block before we, we end the show because I think it's a really interesting project and, I, and many people should know more about it. Sure. So, yeah, we're based in London. We've been around since 2016. Um, CTO is um, Tom Trevelyan. He, uh, he came from Enchain. So if you ever want to come and 
ask questions about you know Enchain, what they're doing, Satoshi's. He, he's, he's got a, a lot of stories to tell. Um, we also um, we are, we're open source. Everything we do is on our GitHub repo. We do provide services to secu to build side chains to secure them, but it's optional. And we're doing some interesting stuff in the commodity space. Uh, we're oh, backed, really? yeah, we're backed by global advisors who are old, you know, kind of were historically commodities um, was a commodities um, hedge fund. So now we're doing things with them on the commodities space to get that on on on, on side chains. Fantastic. And where, where can we follow you, by the way? Commerceblock.com. Commerceblock.com. I'm, you know, I tweet sometimes about my view of the world on uh, Twitter and. But we, we're quite active. We try to. It's go definitely to a really interesting view, and I literally I had a blast talking to you tonight. Thank you so much for edutaining the community out there, dear crypto community and blockchain buddies across the globe. Tonight we had Nicholas Gregory. Thank you so much for coming, and hopefully see you soon. Thanks. <laughs>